today I'm reading from Psychology and Alchemy by C.G. Jung, and this is volume 12 of the collected works of C.G. Jung. And I'm going to be reading paragraphs 16 to 20 of this book today. <clears throat> now, let's see. Sometimes my pens get away from me. Okay, so there were a few items that needed to be uh, reviewed from yesterday. And first of all, from uh, paragraph 14, but it also relates to paragraph 16. The prime task of education of an adult is to convey the archetype of the God image. And so... I'm going to see if I can describe a religious experience for you. And, um, and I'm going to do that by very simple means, which is uh, through uh, the idea of typing. Now, this is between the, the issue of belief and knowing. And so when you look at a keyboard the first time when you're young, you have to believe that you can learn to type, but you don't know that you can type. And so you believe that if you do the exercises, <clears throat> you believe that if you do the exercises, uh, you will uh, ultimately be able to type. But as long as you have to think about where the keys are on the keyboard, you can't type. And likewise with uh, riding a bicycle, um, as long as you have to think about balance and steering and pedaling and braking, as long as you have to think about those things, you cannot ride a bike. It is only when you can forget about those that you know how to ride a bike. And so religious experience is precisely that. Uh, you can go to church for your whole lifetime, believing in whatever they say there. But unless you have experienced and had a religious experience, then um, chances are you will not know about what Dr. Jung is talking about in these pages. And so it's essential that we help people understand what a religious experience is and what its value is. And Dr. Jung was saying that for him, if he didn't believe that there was a supreme value in the soul, uh, and by this he meant uh, the God image, then it wouldn't be useful, it wouldn't be interesting to him to study psychology. But he did believe that it was there. And, uh, and in fact, at the end of his life, he did say, I know, I don't have to believe, I know. And so he saw his role as teaching people the art of seeing and the art of seeing what a religious experience is and how, a, how it can be understood. And so um, one of the comments that he made was that uh, many people cannot see the connection between uh, the sacred figures and their own psyche, regardless of what religion and regardless of which sacred figures we're talking about. Um, and he was, he was irritated because he kept being accused of trying to deify the soul, but he said, not I, but God himself deified the soul. And <laughs> that was, that was his uh, story and he was sticking to it. And so am I. Um, And um, he was also accused of uh, trying to preach a new heretical doctrine. And he said, no, I'm not trying to preach 
any doctrine. I'm only trying to help a blind man see. And um, so he said, psychology is concerned with the act of seeing, not with new religions. Um, and one of the other things that he emphasized is, in order to appreciate religion, you have to experience it. You have to experience, uh, have a religious experience. And he says, we cannot understand a thing until we have experience. We have not, we cannot understand a thing until we have experienced it inwardly. And so you can think about that in your own life, but it certainly applies to uh, typing and riding a bicycle. You cannot uh, understand how to do either of those tasks from a rational point of view. It's only when you experience it inwardly that you can type or that you can ride a bicycle. Um, and one of the um, issues is the issue of archetype. And he says the archetype doesn't posit the existence of a hero. So if we're using the hero archetype, we can talk about the hero archetype, but we may not have a hero here. We can still talk about the form of the hero. And so what he's saying now in... Uh, paragraph 16, where we're going to begin today, is that with knowledge and actual experience, you can get access, you can gain access to um, the God image and to the unconscious. And, and his point was that he was accused of trying to draw people away from religion, and he said, no, that's not the case at all. Uh, I'm trying to help people better understand the dogma. And as we've seen with the Jordan Peterson phenomenon lately in his religious lectures, as people have come to understand um, the Bible a little better, thanks to Jordan Peterson's lectures, now they're being drawn back into the church. And uh, there, there are many a cleric who are sort of amazed that that's happening. And, um, and so then in paragraph 18, he's talking about the fact that God has expressed himself in many forms. And so God is the creator of every form of religion. And we need to understand that it's not just one. And the next point is that we, uh, in paragraph 19, he's talking about being able to endure the paradoxes that come up in religion. And his point is that they aren't going to go away. And um, and what he, his point here in paragraph 19 also is that if you come at it with a prejudicial point of view, uh, then you're going to be barred from having the actual experience. And paragraph 20, uh, what he's saying is that the, the unconscious expresses itself is just so. It's not cooked up. Uh, in your conscious mind. It is what it is. And so he says that experiences of the unconscious are natural and not formulated dogmatically. And uh, he, another way of putting it is he says that uh, psychology refers to the imprint, um, whereas the religions refer to the imprinter. And, uh, and so the archetype is a symbol of unknown content. Okay, so those were uh, some quick summary comments on yesterday and what is going to be in today's reading. 
uh, and welcome uh, Willem and Art. Uh, and uh, he's, Art says, this is opening myself to the truth about my faith. Well, uh, it certainly opened my, myself to the truth about my faith. And uh, what it did was it made me so that I'm even more receptive to, um, to going to church and being in church and having the hymns wash over me at Christmas, I have to say that as I've been working with this, um, Monday night on Christmas Eve was one of the most meaningful church services I've had in a decade, uh, and it's partially because of knowing these things. And Miles says, Jordan Peterson rightly defends not trying to express his belief in God or Creator, or this is admirable this is admirable about him, in my opinion. Um, right, and so I don't have to do that either, okay, because I've had enough religious experiences in my life that I know, and I've been exposed to enough different religions in my life. I lived three miles from the great Buddha of Kamakura, when I was 13 to 18, or 15 to 18 years old, and he was just sitting there meditating, and I was always wondering, what's, it, what's this guy doing? You know, what is this about? And so finally, when I did get into Buddhism about, uh, you know, 50 years later, um, now I do understand what he's about, and and he is about uh, reaching the unconscious, reaching the self, and uh, you know the the same is uh, with Islam. In Islam, uh, you're directed to pray five times a day, and you know what can be wrong with that? You know, taking a time out five times a day. Uh, certainly gives your your mind a chance to rest and regroup, and and uh, I don't see anything wrong with that. And um, so anyway, since we've gathered some folks here uh, to listen, I'm going to go ahead and do today's reading. And so this is Psychology and Alchemy by C.G. Young, and I'm reading. Uh, paragraph 16 to 20, and I'll be happy to take comments or questions as we go on. Paragraph 16. Now, if my psychological researches have demonstrated the existence of certain psychic types in their correspondence with well-known religious ideas, then we have opened up a possible approach to those experienceable contents which manifestly and undeniably form the empirical foundations of all religious experience. The religious-minded man is free to accept whatever metaphysical explanations he pleases about the origin of these images, not so the intellect, which must keep strictly to the principles of scientific interpretation and avoid trespassing beyond the bounds of what can be known. Nobody can prevent the believer from accepting God, Purusha, the Atman, or Tao as the prime cause and thus putting an end to the fundamental disquiet of man. The scientist is a scrupulous worker. He cannot take heaven by storm. Should he allow himself to be seduced into such an extravagance, he would be sawing off the branch on which he sits. Paragraph 17. The fact is that with the knowledge of, the fact is that with the knowledge and actual experience of these inner images, a way is open for reason and feeling to gain access to those other images which the teachings of religion offer to mankind. Psychology thus does just the opposite of what it is accused of. It provides possible approaches to a better understanding of these things. 
it opens people's eyes to the real meaning of dogmas, and far from destroying, it throws open an empty house to new inhabitants. I can, cor I can corroborate this with countless experiences, people belonging to creeds of all imaginable kinds who had played the apostate or cooled off toward their faith have found a new approach to their old truths, not a few Catholics among them. Even a Parsi found the way back to Soroastrian fire temple, which should bear witness to the objectivity of my point of view. And so let me, um, one thing I probably should have done was set up. I, I just want to give you an example of one of my religious experiences. Um, and it isn't going to mean that much to you, uh, but it certainly did mean something to me. And so um, on occasion in recent times when I've been living uh, where I currently live in Annapolis, Maryland, um, I uh, go over to the U.S. Naval Academy and I go in there when, it, when there's no one else there and it's dark inside and while I'm in there um, I um, just meditate usually and one day I was feeling very depressed and I went into the chapel and you will see that uh, the chapel is quite dark but this is the experience I had and in this image, uh, you see a stained glass window. And if you look at the lower three stained glass windows across the bottom, those are by an excellent stained glass craftsman. But he isn't really an artist per se. He's someone that had a picture or an image that he could put together in glass. But the stained glass windows above that, uh, the three arches, including the one with Christ in it, um, is a stained glass window done by Tiffany. And you can see the qualitative difference in the stained glass windows between the three St Tiffany windows and the craftsman's windows. And so, who can say that those Tiffany windows aren't inspired by God? I certainly can't. Um, and also what is uh, significant here to me is these streaks of light and so on that came up in my image. So I've been sitting there um, rather depressed and um, and I was quite in the dark. I was really in the dark. And when, when that light came in, it lighted only me. And so here is the, here's, uh, 10 seconds later, I turned the camera or my iPhone around on myself and just to show how the light had lit up only me. And, uh, you can see that my demeanor is entirely changed here. Um, that, you know, I'm, I'm suddenly happy. You can see that the light is only on me. And for me, that was quite a religious experience. It's one of the few that I've ever had in church. Uh, I've had about three in actual church and only one during a service. But in any case, um, I just wanted to give you a sense of it. Now, obviously, something like that happens by a synchronicity. And so my psyche was ready for something to happen. And just by random chance, um, the light of the sun was coming across on that point on the stained glass window at that time and it lit me up and it entirely changed my attitude and so for me uh, it was a religious experience you may not 
have, feel it that way, and I'm not asking you to feel it that way. I'm saying this is what happened to me and how I reacted to it. Now, um, and so Dr. Jung would call that a synchronicity. And um, so the, the idea of talking about that experience and about typing and bicycle riding is just to give you pointers toward what a religious experience will be. But for you, it will always be different. It never can be the same. And so, um, and so Willem says, I must say that I never believed in any man constructed books or gods as they all lie, but due to my upbringing, I was alone a lot and nature became my God, the one creator who created nature. Dirk says, I wrote something just before Christmas that falls so near to the topic, but it is too long to go into in the comments. Okay, well, that's understandable, um, but we'll be interested in seeing that, Dirk, at some point. And the little gumnut says, this is so true regarding the scientist not wanting to cut off the branch he sits on. And Dirk says, got to go to work. Good night, everyone. It'll be here when you come back, Dirk. Um, I'll put it on replay for you. Okay. And um, all right. So uh, I'm going to go on with this reading now. So I'm reading now from paragraph 18. Maybe I'll have a little of my tea first. Okay, paragraph 18. But this objectivity is just what my psychology is most blamed for. It is said not to decide in favor of this or that religious doctrine. Without prejudice to my own subjective convictions, I should like to raise the question, is it not thinkable that when one refrains from setting oneself up as an arbiter mundi, as a judge of the world, and deliberately renouncing all subjectivism, cherishes on the contrary the belief, for instance, that God has expressed himself in many languages and appeared in diverse forms, and that all these statements are true. It is not thinkable. It is not thinkable, I say, that this too is a decision. The objection raised, more particularly by Christians, that it is impossible for contradictory statements to be true, must permit itself to be, po to be politely asked, does one equal three? How can three be one? Can a mother be a virgin? And so on. Has it not yet been observed that all religious statements contain logical contradictions and assertions that are impossible in principle, that this is in fact the very essence of religious assertion? As witness to this, we have Tertullian's avowal, quote, and the Son of God is dead, which is worthy of belief because it, it, because it is absurd, and when buried, he rose again, which is certain because it is impossible. If Christianity demands faith in such contradictions, it does not seem to me that it can very well condemn those who assert a few paradoxes more. Oddly enough, the paradox is one of our most valuable spiritual possessions, while uniformity of meaning is a sign of weakness. Hence, a religion becomes inwardly impoverished when it loses the waters down its par when it loses or waters down its paradoxes, but their multiplication enriches because only the paradox comes anywhere near to comprehending the fullness of life. Non ambiguity and non contradiction are one sided and thus unsuited to express the incomprehensible. And I just mention the most succinct place that Dr. Jung addressed this is in paragraph 752 of Answer to Job. And there he says, every religious statement of whatever kind is a statement of the psyche. It's not a statement of the physical world. 
And of course, what gets us into trouble is that uh, the fundamentalists want to make these religious statements as statements in the physical world where they don't belong and are not appropriate. Not, okay, so paragraph 19, yeah, let's see. Little Gumnut says, Jung was on point with synchronicities. I think my little religious experiences I had when I was younger were caused by synchronicities and inkling that it's possible it could have been God. Um, well, <laughs> the metaphysical part of it is for you to decide. But if they were synchronicities and they affected you to the point where you remember them now, uh, they were obviously quite emotional, so therefore they um, they did reach down toward yourself. Um, <clears throat> okay, so paragraph 19. Not everyone possesses the spiritual strength of a Tertullian. It is evident not only that he had the strength to sustain paradoxes, but they actually afforded him the highest degree of religious certainty. The inordinate number of spiritual weaklings makes paradoxes dangerous, so long as the paradox remains unexamined and is taken for granted as a customary part of life, it is harmless enough. But when it occurs to an insufficiently cultivated mind, always as we know the most sure of itself, to make the paradoxical nature of some tenet of faith the object of its lucubrations as earnest as they are impotent, it is not long before such a one will break out into iconoclastic and scornful laughter, pointing to the manifest absurdity of the mystery. Think <coughs> <coughs> Things have gone rapidly down Things have gone rapidly downhill since the Age of Enlightenment, for once this petty reasoning mind which cannot endure any paradoxes, is wakened. No sermon on earth can keep it down. A new task that arises to lift this still undeveloped mind step by step to a higher level and to increase the number of persons who have at least some inkling of the scope of the paradoxical truth. If this is not possible, then it must be admitted that the spiritual approaches to Christianity are as good as blocked. We simply do not understand anymore what we simply do not understand anymore what is meant by the paradoxes contained in dogma. And the more external our understanding of them becomes, the more we are affronted by their irrationality, until finally they become completely obsolete, curious rec curious relics of the past. The man who is stricken in this way cannot estimate the extent of his spiritual loss, because he has never experienced the sacred images as his inmost possession, and has never realized their kinship with his own psychic structure. But it is just this indispensable knowledge that the psychology of the unconscious can give him, and its scientific objectivity is of the greatest value here. Were psychology bound to a creed, it would not and could not allow the unconscious of the individual that free play which is the basic condition for the production of archetypes. It is precisely the spontaneity of archetypal contents that convinces, whereas any prejudiced intervention is a bar to genuine experience. If the theologian really believes in the almighty power of God on the one hand and in the validity of dogma on the other, why then does he not trust God to speak in the soul? Why this fear of psychology or, or is, in completely contradiction to dogma, the soul itself a hell from which only demons gibber? Even if this were really so, it would not be any the less convincing. For as we all know, the horrified perception 
of the reality of evil has led to a has led to at least as many conversions as the experience of good. I'll just read that last sentence again. So even if it even if this were really so, it would not be any the less convincing, for as we all know, the horrified perception of the reality of evil has led to at least as many conversions as the experience of good. And I would just add to this, uh, for those of you who remember, uh, I had a vision of Mephistopheles sitting down next to me in my automobile one day. And I can well imagine that if that had happened to somebody in the 19th century or early 20th century, um, that they certainly might be driven into the church uh, as it was because of my broader knowledge of, of Jung, uh, it didn't cause me to do that. However, I did still have to negotiate with Mephistopheles in that incident, and you can find that incident in the YouTube channel here. Just put in Mephistopheles, and <laughs> you'll get the vision. Paragraph 20. The archetypes of the unconscious can be shown empirically to be the equivalents of religious dogmas. In the hermeneutic language of the fathers of the church, in the hermeneutic language of the fathers, the church possesses a rich store of analogies with the individual and spontaneous products to be found in psychology. What the unconscious expresses is far from being merely arbitrary or opinionated. It is something that happens to be just so, as is the case with every other natural being. It stands to reason that the expressions of the unconscious are natural and not formulated dogmatically. They are exactly like the patristic allegories which draw the whole of nature into the orbit of their amplification. If these present us with some astonishing allegories of Christ, we find much the same sort of thing in the psychology of the unconscious. The only difference is that the patristic allegory uh, referring to Christ, where a, a whereas the psychic archetype is simply itself and can therefore be interpreted according to time, place, and milieu. In the West, the archetype is filled out with the dogmatic figure of the Christ. In the East, with Purusha, the Atman, Hiranyagarbha, the Buddha, and so on. The religious point of view, understandably enough, puts the accent on the imprinter, whereas scientific psychology emphasizes the typos, the imprint, the only thing it can understand. The religious point of view understands the imprint as the working of an imprinter. The scientific point of view understands it as a symbol of an unknown and incomprehensible content. Since the typos is less definite and more variegated than any of the figures postulated by religion, psychology is compelled by its empirical material to express the typos by means of a terminology not bound by time, place, and milieu. If, for example, the typos agreed in every detail with the dogmatic figure of Christ, and if it contained and if it contained no determinant that went beyond that figure, he would be bound to regard the typos as at least a faithful copy of the dogmatic figure and to name it accordingly. The typos would then coincide with Christ, but as experience shows, this is not the case, seeing that the unconscious, like the allegories employed by the Church Fathers, produces countless other determinants that are not explicitly contained in the dogmatic formula. That is to say, non-Christian figures such as those mentioned above are included in the typos. 
but neither do these figures comply with the indeterminate nature of the archetype. It is altogether inconceivable that there could be any definite figure capable of expressing ar archetypal indef indefiniteness. It is, it is altogether inconceivable that there could be any definite figure capable of expressing archetypal definiteness. For this reason, I have found myself obliged to give the corresponding archetype the psychological name of the self, a term on the one hand definite enough to convey the essence of human wholeness, and on the other hand indefinite enough to express the indescribable and indeterminable nature of this wholeness. The paradoxical qualities of the term are a reflection of the fact that wholeness consists partly of the conscious man and partly of the unconscious man, but we cannot define the latter or indicate his boundaries. Hence, in its scientific usage, the term self refers neither to Christ nor to the Buddha, but to the totality of the figures that are its equivalent, and each of these figures is a symbol of the self. This mode of expression is an intellectual necessity in scientific psychology, and in no sense denotes a transcendental prejudice. On the contrary, as we have said before, this objective attitude enables one man to decide in favor of the deterministic Christ, another in favor of Buddha, and so on. Those who are irritated by this objectivity should reflect that science is quite impossible without it. Consequently, by denying psychology the right of objectivity, they are making an untimely attempt to extinguish the life light of a science. Even if such a preposterous attempt were to succeed, it would only widen the already catastrophic gulf between the secular mind on the one hand and the church and religion on the other. So let me just read that last sentence again. Last two sentences. Consequently, by denying psychology the right to objectivity, they are making an untimely attempt to an untimely attempt to extinguish the lifelight of a science. Even if such a preposterous attempt were to succeed, it would only widen the already catastrophic gulf between the secular mind on the one hand and the church and religion on the other. It is quite understandable for, uh, then I'm going into paragraph 21, the last paragraph I'll read today. It is quite understandable for a science to concentrate more or less exclusively on its subject. Indeed, that is its absolute raison d'etre. Since the concept of the self is of central interest in psychology, the latter naturally thinks along lines diametrically opposed to theology. For psychology, the religious figures point to the self, whereas for theology, the self points to its theology's own central figure. In other words, theology might possibly take the psychological self as an allegory of Christ. This opposition is, no doubt, very irritating, but unfortunately inevitable. Unless psychology is to be denied the right to exist at all, I therefore plead for tolerance. Nor is this very hard for psychology, since as a science it makes no totalitarian claims. Okay. <laughs> uh, obviously, the religions make totalitarian claims. Anyway, um, I'll look at your comments now. Grace says they go beyond rational. Absolutely. So, synchronicity goes beyond causality, that is to say, they are irrational, says Grenade. And Gray says they go beyond the rational, and they go into the other side, which is the irrational. But they are always very personal, absolutely. Opiami says, uh, 
tip skip improve the acoustic read less converse more sorry about the you're cold etc i i always have this gravelly voice i'm sorry about that um but i'm happy to chat with you as much as i can here i have this gravelly voice because um growing up i was allergic to practically any everything and um 20 years ago, I had the entire back of my throat removed uh, so that I could breathe. And so the result of that is that my voice is a little gravelly all the time. But I can breathe. That's the good news. And so Grenad says, I come here for the readings, but I like the conversation too. He has an interesting skill to pick certain parts of material and interrelate them to a bigger picture. I wouldn't know what to look for. Um, well, it's not a question of looking for things or not. They just happen to you. They just come to mind. Um, if you take a look at a psychological technique called neuro-linguistic programming, NLP, uh, you'll find that one of the concepts in NLP is anchoring. And so what that means is that if I say any word, it's going to anchor in you in a very special way. Um, I normally give the example of the word yacht. And yacht in Dutch is one of 12 Dutch words in the English language. Uh, and, but in Dutch, it means small boat. But for most of us, it would mean something rather larger than small, perhaps a, a 30 or 40 footer at, li at least. But some of us may imagine a yacht as something that's 500 feet long. Um, and so when I say the word yacht, that anchors to something in your psyche and that image comes up, whatever it is, whether it's a 12 foot uh, rowboat or whether it's a 500 foot motor yacht and so what you do is by studying some things will be triggered uh, through this anchoring process and then you will they will remind you it's like a conversation actually too so no matter what I talk about all of a sudden you'll say oh yeah yeah i want to talk about that then and so then you say something and you might say something that's not particularly too closely attached to what i was saying but when you say that thing that sends me off on another um, tangent and so if we have a conversation for 30 minutes we may have started at point A but we may end up at point Z and not remember what point A was and so that's all I'm doing is I'm just saying these are the things that come to my mind and inviting you to find the things that come to your mind um, Martin says uh, you do get nudges from the other where synchronicity has both a way that shows itself yet gives you a warmth that lets you know you are not you are not crazy um, absolutely so it's a psychological situation which uh, which combines with a physical situation uh, and then you say aha and so those are re religious experiences very often. Uh, Dominic says, synchronicities do seem to have a relationship with intentionality and the withdrawal from specific exp expectations whilst remaining conscious yet detached. Um, I'll give you a, a sample of a synchronicity here in a few moments, if you like. Um, let's see. Yep, I have my three coins, so I'm going to give you an I Ching reading. I learned how to do this less than a week ago, but it's uh, definitely uncanny, so we'll give you an, a, a sample. I'd like for someone 
to uh, assume that this book, the I Ching, is an oracle and it's going to tell you something about a given situation, whatever it is. So if uh, someone would put uh, a question on the chat, then I will answer the question in the context of the I Ching. And this is um, entirely about synchronicities. And so uh, the viewers of this video live stream can tell me whether they think uh, the I Ching gets the right answer or not, or gets a uh, synchronistic answer that's close enough to be significant. So Martin says, saying that I am introverted, intuitive, so material reality and non-physical are equal. Um, my art will make it a living. Um, so is, is that the question? Will your art make a living? Uh, let's, uh, <laughs> I think what we could say without looking at, and, uh, at uh, and so Dominic says, what is fate? Um, I think I'll take on Dominic's question. Mar Martin, I, let me tell you that uh, your art will not make a living. Mostly it does not make a living. It, it makes a living uh, very rarely for people who are extremely lucky. And we know people like that from the movie industry. Uh, if you happen to get picked up as a actor like uh, Harrison Ford did. He was a carpenter until he got picked up for Star Wars and then suddenly, boom, he's catapulted into stardom. Uh, that's that's not a synchronicity, that's just luck. <laughs> um, or, but from his point of view, it could be a synchronicity. But so anyway, the key to it is um, let's assume that your art will not uh, make a living for you. And what you need to do is find a way to make a living, whatever that is, and then do your art also. Uh, and, you know, obviously, whatever it is I'm doing with these videos, and in part, it's a form of art for me. Um, I already have gotten some form of living to make it possible. And so um, Bernard says it makes a non-monetary living if you gain satisfaction from it. And, and Martin says, I do. And I do as well, but don't quit the day job. <laughs> yeah, don't quit the day job, absolutely. Okay, so I'm going to do um, an I Ching, and I'm going to answer Martin's, or I'm sorry, Dominic's question, what is fate? And so I have three coins. It happens that I have three U.S. quarters, and they have um, a heads and a tails side. And the objective is to first, in terms of asking the oracle, the objective is to first uh, establish a hexagram. And there are uh, 64 hexagrams based, and there they are in the back of the book. Okay, that's a, that's a graphic in the back of the book. But first, you have to pull together the hexagram itself. And the way this is done is by flipping the three coins and determining uh, whether you get a yin or a yang or a changeable yin or yang. So I'm going to shake the coins, and uh, the first answer I get is a yang. Okay, and so you draw a solid line if it's a yang, and you draw a broken line if it's a yin. And a, by yang, it means that there's one heads and two tails, because you always go for the minority. So. The first throw was a yang. The second throw was a yang. If all the all the uh, 
coins are the same, then that then you get a change, and that's a, a, that I'll explain that in a minute. Okay, the third throw is a yin. I have one tails and two heads, so that's a yin. And so we're going up here. And just to show you what I'm doing in my notebook here. Um, so you start at the bottom here. And so I got a yang, a yang, and the top one is a yin. And that's the lower trigram. And then I do this three more times. So let me do it three more times. I get a young again. So I've got four yangs and one yin. And I get uh, another uh, yin. Okay. keep the, the coins on my desk okay last throw and I get a yin so I got no changes so it's going to be um, whatever it is it is and so then what you do is um, you take the lower three trigram and if I look at this graphic again, I'll just very quickly show you. And by the way, this I'm using the I Ching as translated by Richard Wilhelm and Carrie Baines, who was a very close follower of Jung's. And also it contains a foreword by Dr. Jung in which he does talk about um, synchronicity. And uh, where is the? I'm trying to get back to the the chart again. Okay, so the upper trigram is goes across the top, and the lower trigram goes down the side. And so, if I look at the upper trigram. Um, it is uh, the second column, and if I look at the lower trigram, it is so the the tr the hexagram that we're looking for is fifty four. Um, all right. So the way that was achieved, if you look at this. Um, the upper trigram had two yins and a yang, and that's found in this second column here. And then the bottom trigram had a yin and two yangs, and that's found in this lowest column. So then you look across and down, and the number that's in the box is the hexagram that you want. Okay, and which is the answer. So what is fate is the question. And so I'm now going to read to you, dun da 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 Let's see how this works. Because I'm doing it live, no, no questions asked. Hexagram number 54. Okay, so in this there's a write-up on hexagram 54, which is right here. And the hexagram 54 is the marrying maiden. And um, so the upper part of the, uh, the upper trigram is arousing thunder, and the lower trigram is joyous lake. So the judgment is, the marrying maiden undertakings bring misfortune nothing that would further. A girl who is taken into the family, but not as the chief wife, must behave with special caution and reserve. She must not take it up, she must not take it upon herself to supplant the mistress of the house, 
for that would mean disorder and lead to untenable relationships. The same is true of all voluntary relationships between human beings. While legally regulated relationships evince a fixed connection between duties and rights, relationships based on personal inclination depend on the long run in, in the long run entirely on tactful reserve. Affection as the essential principle of relatedness is of the greatest importance in all relationships in the world. For the union of heaven and earth is the origin of the whole of nature. Among human beings, likewise, spontaneous affection is the all-inclusive is the all-inclusive principle of union. Um, so I don't know if that uh, relates to your fate, um, but. What do you think, Dominic? Did I cover your fate in any way? Um, I mean, I could, I could probably spin a yarn about this, but um, the question is, did it resonate with you? I guess. It, um, and so the question is, let's see if there's something else. And so the image, referring to the image, um, the image of the marrying maiden, it, uh, thus the superior man understands the transitory in the light of the eternity of the end. Um, Thunder stirs the water of the lake, which follows it in shimmering waves. This symbolizes the girl who follows the man of her choice. But every relationship between individuals bears within it the danger that wrong turns may be taken, leading to endless misunderstandings and disagreements. Therefore, it is necessary constantly to remain mindful of the end. If we permit ourselves to drift along, we come together and are parted again as the day may determine. If, on the other hand, a man fixes his mind on an end that endures, he will succeed in avoiding the reefs that confront the closer relationships of people. Okay, well, that's a little bit more uh, appropriate or easier to understand because uh, if we take, if we think of marriage as an example, if if you um, if you imagine a happy uh, time as octogenarians together with you and your wife, uh, when you become in your 80s and you're looking back on your life and the raising of your children and grandchildren, if you focus on imagining that, you're fate is going to be uh, more uh, more copacetic maybe than if you um, keep trying to change things in the early going. So I think that, that in that sense it could uh, definitely relate to fate. And so I, in part I think this may be a suggestion to look at the uh, long-term consequences of anything you do. If you do, you're likely to have a happier life than if you just keep changing back and forth. I mean, one of the mistakes in my own life that I can definitely say is that I tended to uh, leave things uh, too early, and uh, I never gave myself a chance to get promoted up, up, up. I just got um, impatient with things and moved on and that turned out to be a problem over time and so it's it can be better to um, stick with what you've got because if some, if things are bad this year next year they may be better you never know um, so uh, Opiami says I sort of concerned about 
AI lately, malevolent ones. Uh, is it white elephants in more than the room? Uh, okay, I'm not quite sure. So you, you're worried about malevolent artificial intelligence, but artificial intelligence is based on the rational world. And so until we get an irrational art, artificial intelligence, I don't, I think human beings will keep the upper hand. And Grenade says, I do want to get married and settle down one day so it resonates with me and relates to my past relationship. Opiami, I think AI will be an extension of ourselves, all the bad and the good. Uh, we'll see, I guess. And I do agree with you, Grenade, that AI uh, will be an extension of ourselves. Um, and um, but once again, it's like the uh, Brent Spiner who played Data on um, Star Trek The Next Generation, where he had no emotion. And, uh, you know, I suppose that AI could destroy us by some sort of logical process. Um, but, you know, um, certain aspects of human life they wouldn't be experiencing. Buzz Magister says, fate is something that's happened that you think, oh no, I wish that, that hadn't happened. Um, well, it also can be discovered. I think that Dr. Jung um, was saying that if you, um, if you reflect on yourself and you're unconscious, you may be able to um, see what your unconscious is telling you. Um, and I certainly see that in my life. Uh, and uh, Dominic says, I appreciate your effort in addressing this question. Yes, it did resonate for a few reasons. First, the numerological significance of 54 or 9 and my life path number being of the same. Oh, that's very interesting. And uh, Buzz says, hello, everyone. Martin says, the idea of fate for me seems as if you have no power in your life to manifest and thus go along with the tide. Um, Mm, yeah, sort of, but I mean, what Dr. Jung is saying is that yourself is what's deciding and directing you. And so if you mean by that, uh, you are going along with the tide of what yourself wants, um, I think that that uh, is what, it, what he intended. Um, but it doesn't mean that you're going to go along uh, with the tide of every everything that comes your way. Uh, you can certainly be resistant, and being resistant may be your fate and your intentional fate. And uh, so anyway, uh, Miles says, there's a fascinating 15-year-old in Sweden, Greta Thunberg, She's a type of mute who only speaks what necessary. See her TEDx Stockholm and call to action. Yeah, she's a very interesting young woman, Miles, definitely. And, you know, she basically called out the adults, and rightfully so, by saying, you know, what am I going to say about you when I'm 75 and telling my children and grandchildren about you? And, and, it does make people go back to themselves and reflect. Dominic says, two, the aspect of commitment and how I recently enrolled in a three-year school of modern soul science based on Mr. Young and the Western Gnostic tradition, thus making this live event and meeting you. Um, certainly that is a, a kind of fate and synchronicity, Dominic. Um, and uh, I hope it's a, a successful program for you. Um, 
Bernard says, fate is the unconscious manifestation, maybe in Jungian terms. Um, well, Jung said um, it was, um, it's, it's sort of the opposite of individuation. In other words, he says, you're going to individuate one way or another, consciously or unconsciously. Uh, and if you, if you don't know about individuation and you don't do it consciously, then nonetheless you will individuate, but you'll call it fate. Uh, that's the way he put it in answer to Job, uh, I believe in paragraph 646, if I'm not mistaken. Let's see if I can grab my answer to Job here quickly. I might be able to read it to you, but I have to find it. Hold on a minute. That's bizarre. I've had a answer to Joe right in front of me here on my desk for months. It's, ah, it is here. Okay. It's not in my bookshelf after all. Okay, so if we look at page, paragraph 646. I think that might get it. Okay. Okay, so Dr. Young says it this way. Paragraph 607, I'm sorry, it's 746, not 646. Um, the conscious realization of what is hidden and kept secret certainly confronts us with an insoluble conflict. At least this is how it appears to the conscious mind. But the symbols that rise out of the unconscious in dreams show it rather as a confrontation of opposites, and the images of the goal represent their successful re reconciliation. Something empirically demonstrable comes to our aid from the depths of our unconscious nature. It is the task of the conscious mind to understand these hints. If this does not happen, the process of individuation will nevertheless continue. The only difference is that we become its victims and are dragged along by fate toward that inescapable goal, which we might have reached walking upright if only we had taken the trouble and been patient enough to understand in time the meaning of the noumena that cross our path. The only thing that really matters now is whether man can climb up to a higher moral level, to a higher plane of consciousness, in order to be equal to the superhuman powers uh, which the fallen angels have played into his hands. So anyway, um, either you're going to go to individuation walking upright uh, or you're going to be dragged to it by your fate is the way he put it <laughs> and so um, i'm glad i confirmed everything for you uh buzz my that would indicate that she responds to cues miles and something that happens in the mind um bouquet Young is one of, Buzz says, Young is one of my heroes, by the way, along with Herman Hesse. Yep, Herman Hesse is a good one. Uh, Herman Hesse, it turns out, uh, was highly influenced by Jung. And I just have, I read Siddhartha before my freshman year of college. And so actually I haven't, uh, I've recently bought it on Audible, but I've not read it yet. But I did also buy uh, Damien last week. 
and um, by synchronicity it happens that uh, Damien is uh, mentioned in this book, uh, C.G. Young, a biography in books, and in there Miles uh, Sono Shamdasani talks about how uh, Young and Hesse uh, interacted, and especially at the time of Damien and Siddhartha, and Jung had made the comment to him in a letter that uh, he had known Max Damien all of his life. So that was sort of interesting. Um, so and it, so it's uh, quite an interesting synchronicity that you should mention Hermann Hesse today because I just finished reading Damien yesterday. Um, I'm not quite following that, Mopiami, but Jung is amazing. I think Skip is bringing him into view. Uh, by the way, I will need to learn about Hermann Hesse now. Uh, yep, you can get this uh, six-hour book on tape, Damien, and that will uh, be illuminating, and then we will we can talk about what happens with Damien at the end, because... Uh, unless you're fully apprised of everything, you might not understand what it, what happened to Damien in the end. But um, what Dr. Jung said about it was that he was very impressed by uh, Damien. And he had said to, uh, I think it was Carrie Baines, that he didn't think he could explain the unconscious the way Hesse had done. And um, so anyway, and uh, I am going to read uh, Siddhartha again in the next couple of weeks, um, was because uh, that apparently was a book that was right after Hesse had done an um, analysis with Jung. So and Damien was written right after he had done an analysis with one of Jung's disciples, uh, Mr. Long, Dr. Lang. Um, Martin says, I got a vision of going to the dentist as a kid when you read that from the book kicking and screaming is going to happen. Um, and uh, Dominic says, I'm not, I'm not going to comment on your vision, Dominic, because I'm not a mental health professional. So I don't comment on the visions of others, only my own visions. I try to be fairly strict about that in, my, in doing this uh, channel. Um, Buzz says, a synchronicity. My mother had his books, and I never realized it until it was nearly too late. Um, and uh, then he says it was his mother-in-law. You know, honestly, life can be very overwhelming. And so I know I was very affected by Siddhartha when I read it the first time when I was 18 years old or 17. I was 17 years old when I read it. Uh, and I remember being very uh, affected by it. And now I don't remember a word of it or anything about it. So I have to go back and re-listen re to it now. Um, Granat says, even a preposed AI with general intelligence would need some form of parameters to be set prior to entering the deep learning phase. Those parameters are set by programmers. And Buzz says, the bird breaking out of the egg. <laughs> yep, and that's Damien's painting. Uh, Buzz, I love the glass bead game, and, and it is prophetic of virtual immersive reality. Um, yeah, these, certainly Damien was prophetic. 
And um, let me on, let me on. He says, I found Hesse boring as a teen. I never revisited, so can't say. Um, well, I, I think in, when you get a little bit older, it's it's good to look back at it. I, I may have found it boring at that time, who knows, but I certainly thought it was very powerful when I read it this past week. Um, so, um, little guy, I'm not, I barely ever use the word inkling, uh, but when you read the word about a minute after you read my first comment, I got a weird feeling, almost feeling as though they may be some weird connection. Um, well, I, I think that it, uh, what can that be? Uh, it's certainly the connection with the word inkling can be, you know, some hook that you have in your psyche which latches on to something that happens in the physical world like being on this conversation right now and then you may apply some meaning to it and you know only you can uh, you know the parties to that conversation really can say what that means um, Dominic says, any thoughts on Rudolf Steiner? I have absolutely none. <laughs> I, I know the name. I was asked that question, I think, a couple of days ago, and I still have none. Um, and so Buzz says, a mission, it's not for everyone. I'm, you know, to be very frank, um, I, Jung has been so helpful to me in his... Uh, work has been is so comprehensive that I feel overwhelmed just trying to keep up with what I'm doing here um, around uh, Jung's work and you know I did many other things in my career so that kept me busy doing other things and and having different experiences which now I can bring to bear here to a certain extent, but, you know, unless you want to be a college professor, it's not necessary that, that uh, you be fully uh, informed about every philosopher in the world. In fact, I think that that may be a dilution. Um, and, you know, it, it, if we take um, Kant as an example, uh, if I, you know, Jungians say that they're good Kantians, um, and so the fact that Jungians follow the philosophy of Kant doesn't mean that I have to go back and read everything that Kant wrote. I, all I need to do is take out of the digestion of Kant how it came to me through Jung. And... Um, <clears throat> I, I think I've run into Rudolf Steiner's name in Jung's work, um, and uh, and Martin asks, have I read Robert Moore? I have read Robert Moore, uh, and um, I don't recall exactly which things I've read, but... Little gum nuts says just trying to understand if those feelings are synchronicity or not could just be regular coincidences i don't know for the record i don't believe there's any casual relationship um, what i would say is that what you're looking for is something that's numinous okay and so earlier in this conversation i was uh, talking about this scene in the Naval Academy Chapel that happened, and that happened uh, by synchronicity. Um, and it was also numinous because it happened while I was in the chapel. It happened with me sitting in exactly the right place in a 
in a chapel that has 2,000 seats, I was seated in exactly the right place for this to happen to me. And so for me, um, this is numinous and, um, and it very much affected me. Um, and, um, and so, you know, there, there are coincidences and there's synchronicity. And I think a coincidence isn't necessarily numinous. It just happens that you bump into a friend on the street, street corner. Now, you might bump into that friend purely by chance and it has no meaning and you forget about it immediately and never think about it again. On the other hand, you bump into a friend and he's carrying uh, a book of Jung's and you accidentally knock it out of his hand, pick it up, see the name Jung on it, and that leads to a lifetime of study of Jung. Now that would be numinous. Uh, so. Buzz says, I'm glad to have found the I Ching fascinating, and he was a forward in Willem's translation. Absolutely. It's very interesting forward, and uh, by the way, you can find that forward. I believe it's in volume 11 of the collected works, but anyway, you can find it in the collected works, and so if you're a member of our Dropbox, you can you can find it um, and read that forward. Or, you know, I I got a used copy of the I Ching for under 10 bucks and, um, and Amazon had it to me in two days. So you can do that too. Um, uh, So Granada says, if I were to calculate the odds, it would be very small. Dominic, did you have a shamanic or psychosis crisis that brought you to his works? Are, are you talking about, to me, about Steiner or about Jung, or are you talking about Steiner? Um, and uh, Dominic, wait, you literally answering this as I type. <laughs> um, So, um, Miles says, I had a similar numinous event, the sun blazing on me all of a sudden listening to the powerful lyrics of When We Were Young by John Bon Jovi. You had to be there in my mind, sure. Um, and so my numinous experience won't necessarily mean anything to you. I'm only talking about it as a pointer to what Dr. Young is talking about here in terms of uh, religious experiences and how you might recognize them. And so, um, uh, but, and, and so as he says in the beginning of the Red Book, uh, don't follow me, uh, you know, what I don't know anything about your life. Don't expect that you're going to have experiences like my experiences. You're going to have your own. And so the question is how to understand that that's going on. And, you know, if I look back on my lifetime now, I can say, you know, there's certain things that I remember like there's a spotlight on them. And I call them numinous experiences. And, um, and typically they changed my life in one way or another. So I have to say that they were religious experiences. Some of them involved my wife in one way or another. And, uh, uh, you know, when I... Uh, married my first wife um, when I met her. Um, it was a blind date that one of my fraternity brothers had uh, organized, but uh, the first moment I saw her, um, I remember that first moment, um, 
she looked like <clears throat> Judy Carpenter at the time, and um, and so that was a, quite a numinous moment uh, for me. And as a result, we ended up having three children together. But then um, uh, there was a, also a numinous moment that led to the end of that marriage, and which led to the beginning of my current marriage, which has now gone for um, nearly 35 years. So uh, things happen. Um, let's see. So what brought me to Jung specifically? Okay, that was uh, an experience with my anima, um, which I can tell briefly here. Um, so the experience with my anima was that um, when I came back from Japan, I had built a successful business in Japan but I was 39 years old and therefore too old to get a job. And so after age 39, I had to always build my own job. And, but I didn't know that at the time. And so I looked for a job for two years. I finally got one teaching finance at the University of Maryland Graduate School. One of my fellow teachers was a new PhD in psychology. And over lunch one day, she told me, and, and so I was, you know, starstruck by this woman because she had beautiful hair, very much like my mother. And, um, and so there, there was an anima connection between me and her. And uh, she, over a period of 10 days, fully trained me in the Myers-Briggs. This was in 1987. And so that got me interested in understanding people's personality types. And I used that information in my later business life uh, because I later founded a, a company that went public. Um, in my later business life, I used those concepts all the time. And I also use neuro-linguistic programming uh, quite a lot. And I found that very helpful to me as well because of the way it helps uh, create a connection with someone, uh, particularly through the concept of mirroring. And so that was going along and that's gone along since 1987 Con, uh, consistently. Um, but in 1990, then I happened to be in a bookstore idly looking for a book that would be interesting. And um, I may have had the idea that I wanted to learn something more about Jung. And I do remember the, the bookstore employee saying, why don't you try this one and handed me a man and his symbols. And so I took that book and I read it to my wife every night uh, for an entire year. Uh, when we went to bed, uh, I would read from this book three to four pages every night. And what I found was at the end of a year, I felt like I had had a year of psychotherapy. And um, at least that was my feeling about it. And so that got me interested in it. And then uh, from that, I, um, <clears throat> my wife was given Women Who Run With the Wolves, which I still have more or less within arm's reach here. But when I read that, that started a psychogenic experience for me uh, that lasted eight months and resulted in a novel that I wrote um, that is an adult novel and um, it is available to you in the Dropbox so I'm not proselytizing or trying to suggest that you buy my novel but uh, it is now available 
but because I didn't know what was happening to me and this uh, experience, which is very much like Dr. Young's <clears throat> Red Book period experience, um, although the the patina of it is completely different because it involves Japan and it involves the first woman prime minister of Japan. So it's nothing like what happened to Jung, but the experience was uh, comparable. And But Jung's Red Book wasn't available at that time in 1993 when that happened, so I put that novel away for 21 years. And uh, finally I did put it on, on uh, Amazon on Kindle. It's a Kindle book right now. Um, I've not read The Search for the Miraculous. Um, and uh, well, there are a lot of, Martin asks about archetypal songs. There are lots of archetypal songs. Uh, almost, you know, in a way, almost all of them. You know, you hear, sometimes you hear country western people shout out, oh, you tell my life uh, to the country western stars. Well, yeah, they do because they, <laughs> they're they talking about the things that are archetypally in everyone. Um, and so, uh, Dennis has had tip on the TM references. Uh, Jordan Peterson revived my interest and tied an eight-year awakening into being here today grateful to have found this group of like minds. Uh, we're glad to have you here, Dominic, definitely. Um, and the Grenade says, there are not many like me INTJ, except for my wife. My wife is INTJ. The internal provides a place for us to talk about our shared experiences, or the internet provides a place for us to talk about our shared experiences, yes. Um, it certainly does that, uh, and uh, with the caveat that we, I don't, um, I'm not a mental health professional, and I'm not suggesting that there's mental health provided here, but, um, but I do think that a lot of people have very similar experiences and don't know what to do with them, and they also get very confused by modern life, and uh, so it's important to have people like Jordan Peterson, let's say, who provide a grounding to, you know, just average people. Um, and so he, he's quite good at that. Uh, I do think he tends to be a little overly pe pessimistic, but I think that's a function of his profession. Um, And Dominic says to Bernard, I presume, that he might want to look into this school. Um, and Martin says, I am INFJ. Uh, and there was an argument made a day or so ago that Dr. Jung was also INFJ, which may in fact be true. Uh, so that's interesting. It's probably something you could look up. Uh, John Prine is my favorite, so very deep in his references. Uh, Granada, I have to put a mask on in day to, to day life because most people don't like diving into deep topics straight away. Small talk, yep. Um, and you're quite welcome, Dominic. Um, Miles says, I tried to do face-to-face -face social media at my library holding a sign. I was told it's not allowed. Um, yeah, I, I don't know um, how to do it. I think that I, I'm, I'm starting to ponder how to get through to more people because I have an intimation that uh, these religious experiences may cause the kind of consciousness raising uh, that Dr. Jung was talking about for uh, the future. And I have an intimation that 
the methodology for doing that may be within um, the 12 step programs um, because obviously I think that you need a, a quote unquote religious experience in order to really understand what is happening and and that gives you a different perspective than the perspective that humanity has had since the time of Christ, let's say. And so since the time of Christ, Christians have looked upon Christ as the, the divine man, the one example of the divine man. And what Dr. Jung said in answer to Job is that we all have this divine within us and um, you know and in fact I think that's the the last paragraph of the book um, so he says um, So he says, we find ourselves in best agreement with psychological experience if we concede to the archetype a definite measure of independence and to consciousness a degree of creative freedom proportionate to its scope. There then arises that reciprocal action between two relatively autonomous factors which compels us when describing and explaining the processes to present sometimes the one and sometimes the other factor as the acting subject, even when God becomes man. The Christian solution has hitherto avoided this difficulty by recognizing Christ as the one and only God-man, but the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, the third divine person in man, brings about a Christification of many, and the question then arises whether these many are all complete God-men. Such a transformation would lead to insufferable collisions between them, to say nothing of the unavoidable inflation to which the ordinary mortal who is not freed from original sin would instantly succumb. Um, does that sound like anybody we know? <laughs> um, and so it's a it's an unavoidable inflation. In these circumstances, it is well to remind ourselves of Saint Paul and his split consciousness. On one side, he felt he was the apostle directly called and enlightened by God, and on the other side, a sinful man who could not pluck out the thorn in the flesh and rid himself of the satanic angel who plagued him. That is to say, even the enlightened person remains what he is and is never more than his own limited ego before the one who dwells within him, whose form has no knowable boundaries, who encompasses him on all sides, fathomless as the abysms of the earth and vast as the sky. And that is the last bit of the last paragraph of Answer to Job for the benefit of those that don't know it. It's paragraph uh, 758. Um, so, but says, Dostoevsky says he's the Tartar, the doorway to pass through. Um, and um, so, you know, Dostoevsky did have uh, an approach that was worthwhile. Miles, I think it would be great if you wanted to look into that. The question becomes, if the 12-step programs have ways for people to have this experience, which I believe they do because I think it's like step three of the 12-step program, then how can we uh, convey that out into the population at large? That's the question. Because obviously, um, Bill W. and Roland H. had um, these religious experiences that completely changed the way they lived their lives. Um, uh, 
And so Martin says, yes, the space is created in which the magician is present who shares the logos. Yes. Um, so Dominic is talking about the school that he's attending, and it, he says it's a pilot self-study school based on the modern shamanic calling based on Jung's work and the esoteric traditions uh, stemming from Hermetic and Christian Gnostic tradition. Um, you know, obviously there are people in the self-help business in, at varying levels below mental health professionals uh, who um, make a living doing that. And um, I, for me, I'm looking for a way to pull it together in such a way that it can make sense to anyone, any, um, any rational person, let's say. I mean, I think a lot of people who um, are not as rational, let's say, uh, may be drawn to these programs. Um, and uh, or maybe drawn to someone who uh, teaches or helps people by using these programs. Um, and so I, I think that they may have value uh, and they no doubt do have value. I'm trying to figure out how to, how to using Dr. Jung's teachings and the things that he observed in his very complicated lifetime that involved being in Switzerland uh, during two world wars um, and during other very difficult times, the Great, Great Depression among others. Um, I'm trying to make the step beyond what he left us, which is tomes like this. Okay, so World War II Dr. Jung was writing Psychology and Alchemy, um, and I believe, I understand that, you know, he was trying to convey things that he thought would help in the world at large, not only in the clinical space, um, but the clinical analysts, um, the union analysts that make a profession of it, um, they're not interested in the broader um, space. They're interested in working with one individual at a time, and that's, that's their business. And they can, they can be uh, forgiven for that because they created a business around it. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. But Dr. Jung was talking about something much more important, much broader. Um, and yes, it does involve individuals, but it's more than whispering in somebody's ear, here's the secret of life. And then they go out and they whisper in somebody else's ear, this is the secret of life. And somehow we're going to prevent wars that way. I don't see that that's what Dr. Jung thought was possible, but the question is, what is possible and how can we change the way we look at the world? Um, so Grenad says he was uh, recently listening to James Hillman's Alchemical Psychology. It's a very interesting talk uh, that you can get on audible.com. Uh, Dominic says, Let's see. Martin says, Martin, I see you trust that your art will make its place in the collective in time. I too wanted to make a living off my art and felt that was the only way to be legitimate. Not true though, patience rule. Uh, little gum nut starter franchise. Uh, no making money will make the Dow evaporate. Uh, right, Dominic, I know it was something to do with the great dragon as it is a source of creative fire. Uh, Miles, oops, the Christmas, the Queen's Christmas message. Ah, okay, well, that must be good. Um, and uh, 
Dominic, I had spent about 10 of my self-study before I realized that self-initiation goes only so far. Uh, Dominic phases, it seems, inner and outer, and astral, if you wish. Buzz says to me, astral is in the brain, the inner cosmos, for want of a better word, Martin. Yes, the, this is what Dr. Jung pointed out. Uh, legislate Jung as part of Common Core and public schools. Uh, you know, that may be over the top, uh, but at least we could train children and our young people in what transformations their psyche has to go through and in the hope that we can cause fewer divorces, for example, and fewer um, unexpected pregnancies, etc. Um, Bernard, you learned about Jung in high school. That's very, an a AP psychology. Well, that's amazing. Was that a public school? Uh, and uh, I can't imagine that in my school, but I went to a high school that was run by the U.S. Navy. Martin says, did wonder if it was exploration into personal and then collective or just one's own psyche, but that seems different to active imagination to me. And I, I think it would be almost malpractice for a school to try to get students to do active imagination unless they have somebody that really knows what they're doing. Um, and Buzz says, not necessarily, if you make some something mandatory, it creates the opposite effect. I agree with that. And um, and Bernard says yes in public school. Very interesting. Um, too bad we don't have that everywhere. We'd probably be better off. Uh, how much of dream journaling do I incorporate? Well, I do uh, keep a dream journal, and, and uh, I write down my dreams as, as often as I have the strength to do it, um, which is not always, um, because uh, I'll wake up from a dream and I say, oh my God, do I really want to get up and write this down and by the time I think that the dream is gone and I can't even remember what it is but you know fairly often twice a week let's say I do have dreams that have enough psychic energy attached to them that I want to write them down and some of them are quite amusing uh, I think very often I say to myself oh please tell me something I don't know <laughs> So anyway, okay, so we have now gone nearly two hours, and uh, I'm going to discontinue this. Um, tomorrow I will begin um, from, um, from paragraph 22, and just so you know, I've been reading from uh, Psychology and Alchemy by C.G. Jung, uh, volume 12 of the Collected Works of C.G. Young, um, and you can find an electric, electronic copy of it in our Dropbox. If you send me an email, I'll add you to our Dropbox. And uh, so this book uh, has two major essays in it that Dr. Young wrote for the Aronos conferences in uh, Ascona, Italy in 1936 and 1937. What I'm reading from is a um, introduction to the idea of alchemy, uh, which Dr. Jung lit, wrote later, and uh, it was observed by the editors that this amounted to a summation of his um, religious outlook, and it is quite phenomenal. I, I've been reading it more carefully again now in the context of my reading, especially over the last five years. Um, and so just so I mention it again, 
I did four years ago. I wrote a review of the book. I think the review does have um, some validity to what we're doing now. And so I will give you the link to my review again here. And um, and um, so I'm going to try to get through uh, these next um, few paragraphs. Now, um, I'm not going to begin Psychology and Alchemy on uh, January 7th for our meeting that night, because that night will be uh, another meeting at Sammy's, Sammy's Pizza Kitchen with our local group, uh, which will be broadcast at 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time on January 7th, uh, but it will not be uh, on the topic of psychology and alchemy, which will follow the, we'll start with the next week. Um, and so meanwhile, I'm, I'm banking some of these readings to give you an opportunity to read up in advance of some of these discussions that I hope we'll have uh, after um, after Jan starting January 14th, let's say. Um, you're quite welcome, Buzz. And so I, I really um, am sorry when I have to cut off a session that has so many people participating in it, but my wife will be after me. And I have some other things to do today, so I'm going to cut it off now, and hopefully in the next uh, few days I'll be able to read some more. Uh, I do have one task that has to be completed within the next seven days, so that may draw me away for a bit. But anyway, um, peace be with you, Happy New Year, and I'll see you soon.